we have our food myths. So we have our beliefs that came from time when we were perhaps much younger, uh, where we had, there were certain theories, we accepted those theories, but then we may see a study and it contradicts what our previous belief was. For each one of us, if what you're doing isn't working, it's okay to change your change your shift, your perspective and your narrative internally and externally. We don't need more education. You know, we read blogs, we are on social media, we hear influencers speak, uh, nutrition experts. We know often what we should be doing. It's changes in your food choices. It's often no changes in your attitude and your beliefs. Why do you think there's so much confusion around nutrition? I know this is a topic you and I are very passionate about, but is it the messaging that we're receiving from food companies? Is it a combination of misinformation that we receive from well-meaning healthcare practitioners? What is contributing to all the confusion? Because I know, you know, when you were still seeing patients, you saw this yourself. And I certainly feel like almost every day across social media, my team and I will field questions specific to what to eat, when to eat, and all the things that impact those decisions. It's a number of factors. It is very, very confusing because this is not an exact science. It's constantly evolving, but we have our food myths. So we have our beliefs that came from time when we were perhaps much younger, uh, where we had, there were certain theories, we accepted those theories, but then we may see a study and it contradicts what our previous belief was. So now we're maybe questioning that, or maybe we dig in our heels a little bit more to say, no, the study was flawed. And a lot of those studies are flawed and most people don't go further than the headline. So you wake up one day and it's front page news, coffee will kill you, it's bad for you. And then you go to maybe an, another source and you will, or another an expert, you'll be scrolling on Instagram and somebody will say, coffee's the best thing. You should be having three, four cups a day. It's great for dementia, for example. So you don't know. And you become very confused because you don't look at the data. You don't dig into the research. Well, how was the study done? How many people were participating in the study? Was it observational research? Nutrition research is so difficult. People don't remember what they had for breakfast this morning, let alone if they're asked to recall what they ate several days past, for example. They're notorious in under-reporting, over-reporting healthy food. So there's flawed studies. And many of the, if you want to be exact, Exact and do a, a, some of the studies that would beg to be done, you can't because they're on human subjects. And so then you have animal studies and then, well, okay, does that transfer over? So there's a lot of confusion about the studies that are out there. And for many people, food and attitudes towards food, attitudes towards their eating has been, be it's becoming like a religion it's dogma, it's politicized. So you have your camp, I'm carnivore, I'm plant-based. And the farther you go to those extremes, the more you are so set in following this that you put on blinders if there's any attempt to contradict. And I saw this all the time when I was working as a psychologist where it was, they would dig into this belief that, all animal foods are bad. I can't touch, can't even take fish oil. And when you would question them, it was traumatic. And they were so, so set in these beliefs. And so, uh, yeah, I wish it were different, but the science is constantly changing. And the best thing is to to question. And there, there's a character strength of judgment where you weigh both sides, you weigh the evidence. And that's what we're lacking. Yeah, I think you bring up so many good points that there are limitations to the existing nutritional research that's being done. And it's woefully unrealistic for every research scientist to control every single variable about our diets, because the only way to really do that would be to keep humans for three to six months in a controlled environment. And that's not realistic. 
And then I love that you touch on this rigid dogmatism and, you know, for full disclosure, I think there are things that have worked well for me as an example, like when I was in the hospital for 13 days, I was full carnivore for nine months and that helped me heal my gut. And it wasn't that I didn't want to eat vegetables as an example. It's just that the fiber really inflamed my gut. And so I had to kind of slowly work towards a carnivore ish diet, but that doesn't mean that there's not therapeutic value for someone to consider a carnivore diet for a short period of time. And if there are listeners that have been doing carnivore for years and that works for you, that's great. I'm not being judgmental of that. I think the power of bioindividuality is something that I think we both speak to that for each, you know, nutritional paradigm, there are probably bits and aspects that work for many of us. And I think that's something that's so missing from the traditional messaging that healthcare practitioners are not saying to their patients, you know, I'd really love for you to experiment. You know, it, that makes people uncomfortable that in many ways they want to be told this is the paradigm you should, this is the bucket you should fall into and it should work for everyone. Just like intermittent fasting doesn't work for everyone as great of a strategy as it is. I acknowledge it doesn't work for everyone. So really fine tuning what work, what makes you feel like you have good energy, what impacts your sleep in a positive way, what makes you be able to maintain a healthy weight. And for each one of us, that's a little bit different. And so you are so right that there's so many factors that impact the messaging that we are receiving. And then even the messaging that we receive as children and young adults, depending on the families we grew up in. I grew up with a an Italian mom and she was very, you know, she was crunchy before we even had that term, but we had homemade everything and we ate organ meats much to my dismay, I'll be completely transparent. I didn't like eating liver, not even as a child, because it was very metallic tasting. But I think as I, I as I got older, I really appreciated that I grew up that way because it certainly gave me a different perspective than perhaps some of my peers. And when you're working with patients and talking to patients about their childhood experiences, the impact of their families, I'm sure that you probably see a wide range of experiences, both positive and negative. So as an example, if someone grew up eating a hyper-processed diet and 70% of Americans are eating most of their nutrition from hyper-processed foods, and we know there are a lot, there's a lot of research to identify the problems that can come from that, for you being a mental health expert, I'm sure depending on the way that people ate, it probably impacted how they felt about themselves and their behavior vis-a-vis -vis with others. Oh, absolutely. So I've always been really fascinated by the psychology of eating. And there's that old saying, you are what you eat. And I've looked into how we come to have our attitudes towards food that start when we're really little and how they evolve and how they change. So I want to get back to something that you said about being carnivore, because I think that is so critical. And that is, it was for a short period of time, you were doing an experiment, and you were open to discovery. I wonder how I will feel I'm going to heal. But you did not have that all or nothing belief, I will never, never eat a plant again carnivore is the way for me. This is it. And I think many people fall into that trap. And it does start, our attitudes towards food start when we are really, really little. And it is how someone is described is often based on how they eat. And it starts when they're really little. So, and we describe our parents that way, like, you know, oh, I just, you know, we ate processed foods, my mom hated to cook, or as you just said, you know, she was giving us really uh, homemade, nourishing meals. So we learn from our parents, but they also describe us. So I have twin grandchildren, they are 15 months, and they are in their twin high chairs. And there are differences. So one is very delicate. She takes a blueberry and it's like precisely gets it to her mouth and studies it. Whereas the other twin, he is like scoop it up, shove it in his mouth, half of it goes on the floor. So what do we do as parents or as grandparents? One's a, a messy eater. We start, or she's a picky, she's a meticulous eater. And these labels stick. So 
how you your personality is really tied in to how you approach food and how people then label you. So the good eater, oh baby, is, a good, is she a good eater? And then what about if the good eater starts to eat too much? And then they become, they have start having weight issues and, or the, the picky eater becomes the picky child, the difficult child because she won't eat or she, or he or she is um, just, you know, eating uh, everything in sight or has these radical food preferences. And so it starts there. And then a lot of times, you know, parents are, it's stressful. And so you, of course, just like you may say, my child's not going to watch TV, you know, when they're, my toddler's not, we're going to just have all these books and interactive activities. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got a stressful day, you're working from home, uh, you, uh, you know, and you find that, okay, you know, the iPad, the TV, well, it works. And same thing with food. So you may set out with really good intentions. I'm going to have all home cooked meals and from scratch. And well, then what happens is you're harried, you're home from work, you're tired. Um, and so you reach for something that is processed. And that's where the food companies know this. And they are so, so good at hijack our taste buds. They spend billions of dollars on research for that combination of sugar, salt, and fat. So then it's a true addiction that can take over. So of course, they're going to want that over perhaps your homemade version. And so it really does boil down to balance. So as opposed to an all or nothing, again, we're going to that not you know, they'll never have any processed food. They're never going to, you know, have a snack that is just, um, you know, store-bought or uh, something that might be ultra processed, but it is how you balance that with other foods that are whole made, nutritious, um, whole unprocessed foods. I think you bring up so many good points. It's about finding balance. You know, I know when my boys were younger, now they're teenagers and, you know, one drive. So if he wants to go get Chick-fil-A, he could easily do that without, and he has a job, you know, as a teenager, he could go easily do that. And I would never know, but when they were younger and I prepared every single meal, I mean, I was so fully entrenched as a parent. And then you start to realize as they go to birthday parties or they go to school, they get exposed to different things. I have one child who is, he has some food allergies to peanuts and tree nuts uh, he's a little more sensitive. So if he were to eat Chick-fil-A, he would get digestive distress. He would be the first person to tell me it tasted good at the time. And then I feel miserable afterwards. And then my other son, when he was younger, if he had artificial food dyes, he, both my boys have, have been well-behaved young men, but he would go from being a well-behaved child to all of a sudden just being super hyper, hyperactive, couldn't, you know, control his mouth, couldn't control his body. And I would say to my husband, it's red dye number 40. We got to the point where we knew don't ever give him, you know, liquids with that in it. If you went to a birthday party, it was always a disaster afterwards until he kind of worked it out of his system. But acknowledging that it is okay if 90% of the time you are eating a nutrient dense whole foods diet and doing most of your cooking, you know, when I say most of your cooking, meaning I'm a realist, I acknowledge not everyone can do a hundred percent all the time. Uh, I think you can get away with a little bit of, you know, meals out. And, you know, if you have a bag of chips, I don't want people, you know, then becoming the, uh, becoming the other direction of being orthorexic. That's one of the concerns that I have is that we can go on to develop very unhealthy relationships with food and starting to call things good and bad and being very pejorative about our relationship with food. And so even though I tell my children this, I'm like, listen, you spend most of your time during the day away from your parents. So, you know, you know, the things that make your bodies feel good and you acknowledge the things that make you feel not so good, you know, after the holidays and a lot of sweets and eating out. And both my kids were like, I can't wait to get back to eating the way we normally do. But having said that, helping people understand that giving yourself grace is certainly very important. That internal dialogue that we have with ourselves is very important. I think that we should you know, speak to ourselves lovingly and without judgment, because many of the things I hear, especially from women, as an example, are that they judge themselves so harshly. They're like, I can't believe I ate X again. I can't believe I ate that bag of cook, that box of cookies or that bag of chips or whatever it is. 
helping people understand that you can find a reframe and get back on track and, and helping people understand that, you know, we're not suggesting that everyone eat this, you know, pristine monk like lifestyle. That's not what we're advocating. What we're advocating for is attempting to determine what foods make your, your body feel good, eat more of them and avoid the foods that don't make your body feel good. I mean, those two simple premises alone can be very, very impactful. Oh, absolutely. And that's really the message that you want to pass on to your children. And I love what you said about your son and coming to that realization himself. I was a walking example of what not to do raising kids, my two daughters. Uh, so this was in the 80s, early 90s. And I decided I read Diet for a New America and I was going to be a vegetarian and then later a vegan. So I raised them that way. I had a, this was the days before Whole Foods. I had a food co-op with a bunch of friends. We would get caseloads off a truck of organic uh, and they were raised that way. And had some time, which I one of the biggest mistakes I made was thinking that it was okay for kids to be vegan. I mean, I look back and if there was one thing I could have done differently, there are many things I could have done differently, but that was definitely one. So I was so self-righteous. I thought that everything I did was right. And what happens when you have these food rules that go to the extreme. And I've seen this where kids are not allowed to touch that cake at a birthday party. They are the, the distress that you are causing and the upset psychologically or as a family system can really be more deleterious to their physical health and your physical health than letting them have the treatment. Unless they have celiac disease, unless they have life-threatening food allergies where they need an EpiPen. But People decide that, oh, I've, I've seen people say, well, they don't eat gluten, they don't eat soy, they don't eat corn, they don't eat sugar. And so they are really at a disadvantage in terms of you, they're going to rebel. And we can talk about the stages of development and, and what happens when they reach adolescence or by middle school. So having that sense that they will, you, you decide, well, okay, there are certain things you may decide, this is how I'm going to run my household, certain, but having it too dogmatic. And I remember having argued, my husband took my younger daughter to a McDonald's. I'm like, I went ballistic, McDonald's, how could you do this? And so the stress of that, so many times that I, when I look back at family events, I say, well, why did I get so upset about what they were eating? My, old, my younger daughter said something to me a few days ago. She said, you know, mom, uh, she, they were over with their, their twins. And she said, you know, we, we ordered, it was a, a Christmas Eve and we ordered Chinese food. And she said, you know, it was so nice to be with you that you just ordered off the menu and you didn't make a big deal about the seed oils or what you were eating or have your own food as opposed to eating what we were eating. She said, it was just such a nice experience. And that really meant a lot because there she remembers, my other daughter as well, times when occasions were ruined. I would go to a restaurant and, oh, they would, I didn't even have to say anything, but they could tell by my body language unconsciously that I was disapproving of what they were ordering. And so it, to, it, there's two words that come to mind. If you think you know uh, what's good to eat or for your kids to eat, brown rice, because that was it, you know, in that time period, I was macrobiotic for that. Brown rice was like, I would remember walking out of like, you know, oh my God, they don't have brown rice. This is terrible. Well, what are we finding today? We're finding that, and Dave Asprey talks about that, our ritual friend, like it's the white rice that's actually better for you than the brown rice, which is full of arsenic. So who knew? Yeah, no. And I thank you for sharing your story. And I, I think it really speaks to the fact that we, even as parents, we evolve. You know, I will share with my community, I don't know if I've shared this before, that from the time that I've had my very first dog, I stopped eating mammals. I still eat, I still ate fish and I ate poultry and I ate plenty of, pr plenty of protein that I thought at that time until I met Dr. Gabrielle Lyon four years ago. Having said that, when I was hospitalized in 2019, the thing that I thought about, I thought about two things during my 13 day hospitalization. Number one was water. Cause I was so dehydrated. Number two, I thought about a bloody burger. All I wanted was a juicy 
rare to medium rare burger. And from that point on, I started eating mammals again. And I will never forget, my oldest son thinks this is the funniest thing. They ate turkey bacon for like the first 10 years of their lives. And so when I got out of the hospital, first thing I said is, okay, there's no more turkey bacon, you know, which we all know doesn't taste all that great. Uh, and, and so my kids were like, what is this? I was like, that's pig bacon. They were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And so understanding that my own issues. I don't even want to do it's not even that I'm being pejorative with myself. I thought that was the right decision for me and my family at that time. And now they laugh about the fact like mom will order steak or bison most days of the week or make that at home and rarely eats poultry and eats fish occasionally. But it's like the whole paradigm of nutrition shifted. And I always tell my kids, listen, know better, do better. So if you at some point in the trajectory of your nutritional philosophies have evolved, that's a sign of someone that is open-minded, that is working on their internal personal development. And I always say, know better, do better. And so there's no judgment for any of us. My mom for a period of time was vegan for over 10 years, and it's taken a long time to get her health back on track because there were so many years where she was chronically under eating protein and she's now retired. She's 77. She talks openly about this. I'm not sharing anything that my mom doesn't talk about herself, but she says all the time, I just didn't realize how much better I feel eating an omnivorous diet. So eating plants and eating animal protein. And so for each one of us, if what you're doing isn't working, it's okay to change your, change your shift, your perspective and your narrative internally and externally. Oh, absolutely. And our mutual friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, and she was the one who convinced me. It's like, uh, yes. And now I am carnivore ish most mm -hmm. days and order. I would never, never order a steak in a restaurant, for example. And now, yeah, I, I eat um, mostly meat and, and love it and crave it. Yeah, it's amazing how that happens. Now, you kind of alluded to Erickson's stages of development, and I think this is particularly helpful for listeners to understand these. And if anyone has taken human psychology, you've been exposed to this, but not only how does that impact how our children are navigating food choices, and I'm speaking to parents of teens in particular, because now the, the teenagers will push back a whole lot more. If there's something they don't want to eat, you know, I'll say, can you just eat some broccoli, like eat two bites of broccoli? And sometimes they'll say, I just don't want to. But how these stages of development impact not only ourselves and our families, but also the dynamics within our families. Sure. And uh, when he did his original work, uh, we were still in very much of a traditional uh, way of looking at particularly gender differences. So his theories um, are now interpreted as being much more fluid than they were at the time. But generally, it, it you can look at each stage and see it played out in food, food choices and eating behaviors. So What's most crucial when you're an infant? Trust, that trust that when you're hungry, that milk will be there. And then you get to a stage beyond that, which is about 18 months to around two, where it's all about autonomy, me, 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 me. And so that's where, you know, we talk about the terrible twos. And so they will have fits. They'll only want to eat a certain food or they'll reject, they'll throw, you know, what they don't want. And that can be very, very challenging. And often parents feel very guilty about that. And the more you can give them some choices. And uh, then the the next, there's other stages, the preschool stage, where there's still like initiative. And, and then you reach the, what in Freudian terms is called latency, the school age. Now those are blissful. And that's where you find, you know, your kids want to take cooking classes. They'll cook with you. And uh, they're very, they're much more obedient at that stage. And so you may falsely think, oh, you know, this is, um, I have these food rules and they're so compliant and it'll always be that way. But then the next stage which is it could happen in at, at middle school, adolescent, in high school, and definitely they go off to college. And that is identity. That's their task to have an identity. So how is that displayed? Well, if you have kids and you, I know you have someone going off to college, they come home at Thanksgiving and there's some change. They've changed 
po their politics, their political views, but it's often over food. It's often uh, if you raise them, you know, as as I did, uh, as vegans, vegetarians, they're going to, my daughter, she's like, yo, my God, we stopped it. Oh, that beef jerky was so good on the road. And <laughs> they are establishing that. Or if it's the opposite, uh, you're going to have someone come home and say they're a raw, vegan, plant-based and reject everything that you are cooking for Thanksgiving. And so often battles ensue because of that. And then you get to a point where, uh, and there's I, the role typically in the third in the 20s but it's pushed back to the 30s where it is intimacy to have connection with somebody and we are so influenced by our peers what we eat and how we eat so i've had people say you know i'm in a restaurant and i was with my friends and i didn't really want that but i ordered it because i was feeling like shameful or embarrassed, or I would be judged if I didn't eat what they're eating. So it's like, you know, from Harry Met to I'll have what she's having. Well, yes, you do it. You may not want to do it. Um, it's, we see it often played out around alcohol because you don't want to upset people. You don't want to be judged as being different. And this can start in, in grammar school, middle school as well. It's, and um, But it is often, you know, you are uh, what your friends eat. And the uh, and then you get to a point where often habits change in your 30s or 40s. Now, maybe you have a family, you have um, a career, you are looking at leaving a legacy. And so you're starting to think about, oh, I'm going to I'm going to start. Maybe I should work with a nutritionist. Maybe I should get a personal trainer. Maybe I'm going to get in shape. And so that's the time for that. And then there's some another category that we often ignore. And that is as we get older. And it's ego integrity versus despair. What is ego integrity? Well, you're curious about the world around you. Maybe that means you're going to have new adventures. Maybe you're going to change how you're eating. I see this now. I'm like your mom. I'm in my 70s, about to be 74. And amongst my friends, they are stuck just like they have the same hairdo, the same makeup, the same dieting approach. They're calories in, calories out. They are often, they've had success with Weight Watcher or they are focusing on old theory because they are not curious. They're not reading new things. They're not coming into, they're not focusing on moving forward. They're just focusing on the past. And when we get into serious old age, it's losing appetite, losing, you're lonely, you're alone. And I saw this with my mom, where she would only eat ramen, like the packaged awful stuff, because uh, you lose your, your, often your taste is compromised. But um, so uh, if you're listening and you have older parents that to, to make sure that they are not starving themselves. And usually it's with protein. And uh, that's an area where we see so many issues, particularly with women, uh, with animal foods, with, um, for example, the, the gender differences, we can get into that as well, kind of the traditional gender differences that really shape our habits. Yeah, I think it's really important just understanding that, you know, whether we are lifelong learners, whether we are able or capable of being flexible or trying new things. I do see in my parents a degree of rigidity now that I didn't see when they were younger. And I think that's a byproduct of many, many factors, but people may be listening and they may say, you know, family members, loved ones, we start noticing they want to eat dinner at five o'clock. They're rigid about that. They only want to eat, you know, four or five foods. That's how my dad has become. He's very focused on probably four or five foods and that's all he eats. And I think he's, as an example, he's chronically undernourishing his body. So you, to your point about the protein piece. And I think that for a lot of individuals, whether it's changes when they become empty nesters, whether it's changes in job roles, whether it's changes in their relationships with their significant others, I think some people weather that better than others. You know, if they've done a lot of personal development, I, I feel like Personal development is one of the most important things I do for myself, just so that I can continue to show up as a healthy, well-adjusted adult. And, you know, maybe it's pivoting and making changes. Maybe it's, uh, you know, changing relationships that I have with friends. You know, I always say I've been very fortunate that most of my friends I've had my entire lifetime 
but sometimes friendships aren't meant to be lifelong friendships and, and acknowledging that that's okay as well. When you talk about the gender differences, what are some of the things that you saw with your patients in terms of men versus women? You mentioned SECO, so calories in, calories out, which is what I was taught as a clinician, you know, tell your patients to eat less and exercise more. And we know that it's just not that simplistic when we're dealing with weight loss resistance or dealing with, with wanting to lose weight. What are some of the things that you saw characteristically with the differences in genders that had the biggest impact on their kind of health and wellness goals? So I'm going to talk about what I saw anecdotally, as well as what the research in it's more, it's not the psychology of eating, it's more accurate might be the social psychology of eating. So those who are listening, if you've ever been to a bridal shower, a baby shower, and I also want to preface by saying that I'm talking about traditional masculine feminine roles. There's blending, there's fluidity, and these tend to be the stereotypes. Um, but I think it's worth noting these stereotypes because they are often deeply ingrained. So I have never been to a ladies' luncheon where they would serve a steak. They would serve a salad and maybe little strips of chicken on the top. That would be your lunch. Now, if you are in my age category or if you're getting older and middle-aged women, you want to increase. We know, and you've talked about that on many of your podcasts, um, the need to up your protein intake and particularly the uh, how that could be so important for your physical health and your mental health. So that would be the traditional approach. But if the guys were going out uh, and they, and again, this is very stereotypical. Um, so, but what would be on the menu? What would they order? It might be a piece of meat. It plays out in restaurant design. So there's a lot that goes into the surroundings of how you eat. The china, the, the table settings, a lady, there used to be the, this evolved from tea rooms. So the ladies' little cucumber sandwiches that were served in tea rooms that were all decorated in pastels, where the, the steakhouses, where the guys would eat their business lunch. And we're talking about, you know, 40s, 50s um, in that era. But, you know, it would be masculine. There'd be dark paneling uh, and you would, you know, often, you know, stuffed animals that would be on the wall. You would feel uh, as this were not catering to women. In fact, they even had, I don't know if they still do, they, I'm sure they don't do this, but they would have a ladies cut. Do you remember that? Uh, if you would order a steak, you would get the ladies cut. Um, and, and men, I, I was talking to uh, people who would uh, say, you know, they would make fun. Let's say you were at a poker game and you would order, you didn't order the, the Italian beef sandwich, you'd order the salad. Oh, they would make fun of you for that. And so these, these stereotypes die hard. In fact, there was um, a yogurt brand that they, this was um, about 20 years ago, and they thought maybe 10 years ago, they uh, wanted the men to be buying more yogurt. But the problem was they weren't picking up, they weren't buying them because the yogurt cartons were too feminine. They were in these pastels. So then they changed the name. They had a bull, uh, a brown, they made it brown and black with a bull on the package. And guess what? Sales to men tripled. Uh, just because of the packaging. Uh, Brian Wansink used to be at Cornell. I don't know if he still is. He's written a book about the this topic and how restaurants and food companies are working so hard. And it's often the environmental cues. How you say something on the menu, for example, is going to influence whether you order it and whether you're going to think it tastes good and how much you eat. So um, yeah, so gender differences do, um, they they die hard. And yeah. often, you know, if you've been raised in that environment or you, um, and especially, I think we're talking about people more in my generation or older who were raised in that way. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating because I think about every steakhouse I've ever been to has had this very masculine feel versus True Food Kitchen, which is probably leaning more in a plant-based 
difference is, you know, you get very small pieces of protein. It's the aesthetics are equally beautiful, but just completely different. And what I find interesting is when I reflect back over my lifetime, when I was in a sorority in college, I remember these kind of unspoken rules, if you will. There were definitely young women that that struggled with eating disordered behavior, both anorexia and bulimia. But I don't recall ever being in a place where women ate a lot of food. It was like this unspoken rule about you control your appetite, you control your weight. And I, I think that unlike men, I feel like a lot of the gender messaging that that most people feel throughout their lifetime that come from, you know, back when people used to read magazines, uh, but you see on social media or that you see on the news, it, it's almost as if women are expected to control what is an otherwise normal thing to eat food, socialize, et cetera. Men can drink to excess, eat to excess. It's very different, but somehow it's not socially acceptable for women to do the same is that something that you've seen kind of evolving over the last 20, 30 years? Because when I reflect back and when I was preparing for our discussion today, I kept thinking, I was like, wow, you know, you talk about these social messages that we kind of maybe don't even acknowledge they're subtle, but they are impactful. Yes, absolutely. And I think what this gets to is the, what is the real implication if you have a healthy appetite, a big appetite, a hearty appetite, well, it's not just what you eat. The implication is sexual, that you have a sexual appetite. And so this was, you know, a hundred years ago, this was, you know, women had were corseted and they couldn't eat. Um, but how would we judge somebody who was a hearty eater? Uh, there, that would be something you would be uh, looked down upon by uh, society because of that. And there's been films that show that. Uh, Chocolat, for example, um, there's a, an old movie, Tom Jones, it's from the 60s. And it, the sex is played out over eating. They're gnawing on these chicken bones. And uh, so the idea is that if you're a female, and you have this hearty appetite and you are, you know, you order the steak and you finish it. Well, what is that going to say? Um, there actually used to be a food rule that uh, uh, this was in the 50s, for example. You don't order spaghetti on the first date. Why? Because it's, you're going to make a mess and you won't look dainty and delicate and have uh, good table manners and you'll be judged. So, uh, yes, we're talking about the past and things have evolved and changed a whole lot. Um, but for some people, and particularly in an older age group, uh, this is still, you may not recognize it, but it's still ingrained where you might not uh, be the one, you know, eating everything on your plate um, because you didn't, wouldn't want to be judged. I remember. But I was starting to date my husband. This was in the late 60s in college. And his parents would take me out to dinner as I was first getting to know them. And I remember like, you know, hardly eating anything. And they would say, oh, she eats like a bird. But then coming home and what would I do? And I would take the cereal. I would basically eat bowls of cereal. Um, and that evolved into really bad habits in terms of binge eating on, on sugar and uh, being really out of control with eating, but never in public. And there are a lot of people, one of the signs of binge eating is you do it in secret. You are comfortable alone, but if you might go out um, with other people, uh, you would be um, restraining yourself. Yeah. Let's talk about the shame around eating because I have a family member who eats secretively. And it, it always pains me when I know that this behavior goes on because it's a sign of a larger issue. It's whether it was messages this person imbibed from their parents or their father or whomever, they just don't feel comfortable eating a nourishing amount of food around other people but they will then go home and they'll eat a lot of like sweets or salty foods. And the, and it's because they have a very shameful impression, not only of themselves, but of the eating itself. And so I know this can be very profoundly impactful and in some ways can lead to other disordered relationships with food. But I, I'm, I'm sure that you probably saw lots of, of patients that struggled with this as well. 
Yeah, it has, there's so many reasons, but it often, what are they thinking? What are their thoughts? Uh, and first of all, it might be, it's eating is not safe. And so even getting a menu, what am I going to order? And it might be a real fear of being judged. Uh, maybe I'm, I can't order, this is too expensive, I'll be judged that way. Or perhaps it is, uh, so, and this is where orthorexia comes into play, where, and I, I used to look at a menu like that, and uh, it was, uh, oh, wait a minute, that can of fish because of the, the toxins of mercury. Wait, how is this, is this beef grass-fed? Uh, is the salmon, you know, farm-raised or wild? And those are good questions to ask, um, but when it paralyzes you, uh, so, it, and again, it comes down to balance. Well, how will this one meal uh, really impact me? Uh, but it, so it is seeing danger in every choice. Uh, and then is the danger of being judged. What will they think of me if I eat this? Sometimes it is also just a fear of the eating process. I know somebody who uh, takes, takes everything home with her. She doesn't eat, but she asks for a, a doggy bag. And she takes it home. And it, so it's feeling uncomfortable with the actual mechanics of eating and swallowing and what if I choke? And, um, and there are all kinds of distortions. And it's usually the what ifs. What ifs are, are really so detrimental uh, when you find yourself saying that. And it's seeing danger everywhere. The problem is that what you're doing is inducing a stress response. So uh, it's probably having a worse impact on your, certainly your mental health, but even your physical health, that stress response of being so worried about what you're eating is going to, in the long run, do you in a lot more uh, seriously than if you had just eaten it. And then uh, you have, I'd say, well, you know, I might have uh, enzymes with me or uh, ways of detoxing uh, so that uh, the effect will not um, be so consequential. Um, so there, there's that. And yes, many people with, particularly with binge eating, will go home and it's, and often it is the ultra processed food. So we have to take that into consideration because maybe they're at a restaurant and there are good choices. Maybe they even are eating a little bit, but what's hijacking them? They're hostage to the cereal, the cake, the crackers, the um, whatever is like, and it's that carb addiction that are addiction to the ultra processed foods, which as we said, those manufacturers have worked so hard to make this attractive. And at the end of the day, it just could be like, it tastes good. And it's also habitual. So I'm going to get into my, you know, and often you're uncomfortable. Let's say you're going out and you're in a restaurant with other people. Well, maybe you're not so comfortable. You know, your, your pants are too tight and you're thinking about looking good. You don't want your, that's another issue. You don't want your stomach to, you know, look like you have a, a you know, a pregnant belly. Uh, and so, but now you're home. And now it's, you take off your, you know, you got your comfy PJs on. And so the, the situation there is, yeah, you're going to reach for that pint of ice cream or that uh, bowl of cereal and you can, and it, maybe you're pairing it with watching TV, for example. So those situations, it becomes a habit after a while. Yeah, that's really helpful. And and there are two books that I think for me really shifted my perspective about ultra processed foods. Number one is a book by Michael Moss. So it's Salt, Sugar, Fat, excellent book. And then most recently, I read The Dorito Effect by Mark Schlotzker. Mm -hmm. And boy, between the two of them, it'll, I mean, if anyone wants to learn more about the impact of Bliss Point and how food purveyors, if you will, they make these foods as addictive as possible. So if you think it tastes good and you keep eating and eating and eating and you never get full from the Dorito or the really super fatty ice cream that you're consuming, there's a reason for that. And it is not that you are weak or that you don't have willpower. It has a lot to do with what's going on with the neurochemistry in your brain and, you know, nulling responses that we would have if we sat down and ate a 10 ounce steak and we were like, oh my gosh, I can't eat another bite. You know, that leptin signaling is also uh, dysregulated. Now, if someone's listening and they feel like they need to, find a practitioner that can talk to them about their disordered relationship with food. What is a, a good resource point for them if they're looking for a clinical psychologist to work with or a mental health specialist? 
that can help them navigate the feelings that the uncomfortable feelings that they're experiencing and their relationship with food are there resources or um, places that they can go to look for a qualified practitioner in their area? Yes, absolutely. So uh, first of all, we do have a severe shortage of mental health providers. The number of people retiring as psychologists, social workers in droves, we also have not enough people going into the profession. Uh, so there's that one issue. There might be a long waiting list. Uh, it might be uh, out, out of your, your reach in terms of your insurance plan. But it also, I think there's a danger here, and that is you are into a medical system and you may be receiving a diagnosis too quickly. And now you've pathologized what are some, some patterns, some habits that you can learn to break. And so what I would suggest is you actually start with a health coach because a health coach is going to be aware of where you are and where you want to be. And they are going to help you see what's right with you and not what's wrong with you, because that's what we do in often psychology. We get the diagnosis and uh, we are quick to diagnose. So a health coach could spot those individuals who her seriously need more a higher level of intervention. If you're anorexic, for example, which that's life threatening. Uh, and so that would be critical. Uh, but often the mental health side, they are not taking into account nutrition or functional nutrition. They might not even ask what you're eating. They're already jumping to the conclusion that you have a mental health disorder, an eating disorder. And I used to do a lot of testing on units for um, women, particularly it was adolescent women with eating disorders. The food that they served was like not really good. And so uh, there's that carryover. They are not trained in nutrition. Uh, they're trained in mental health. So you're not going to get that side of you. And we know that if you would have somebody help them with getting better nutrient, a nutrient-dense diet, then their decision-making will change because those ultra-processed foods are uh, what their brains are being hijacked. And when you know David Perlmutter wrote about this, and brainwash. And so we want to make sure that they are uh, getting the right nutrients. So perhaps having starting with a coach, and then you may have a nutritional consultation where somebody can help you develop food plan. But and, and often people are smart. They know it, but we have something called an intention behavior gap. What is that? Well, we don't need more education. You know, we read blogs, we are on social media, we hear influencers speak, uh, nutrition experts. We know often what we should be doing. Maybe we wake up every day saying, okay, this is the day I'm going to say. And then by the end of the day, life happens. And so there's their gap between their intention and their behavior. And a coach can really help you start where you are, making some really small changes. It's changes in your food choices. It's often no changes in your attitude and your beliefs. So they might ask you the situation we're talking about where you're not eating in a, you're out with people and you're not eating in that restaurant, let's say, and then you go home and you binge. Well, what is it? You know, tell me more about what is the consequence if you were to eat? And they might say, well, I get gassy. I'm bloating. I don't want to, you know, that's a big deal. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm with people. I don't want to, um, to be looking that way or um, it's embarrassing. And so then they might really walk you through uh, how you might change that. And so, and that can be really, really beneficial. No, thank you for that. It's interesting. Even as a nurse practitioner, I know that for my friends who recently finished residencies or went through medical school, for the nurse practitioners that are still students, um, there is a lack of, or there are not enough clinicians going into mental health areas. So I 100% agree with you that it can be challenging. If someone's listening and saying, I'm trying to get a child, a teenager, a young adult, myself into finding someone that's qualified in my area, and I love the idea of utilizing health coaches. I think in many ways, health coaches can be a bridge. They can work in partnership with clinicians. In many instances, they're working in their offices already. My functional medicine physician, who's our friend, Dr. Aaron Hartman, uh, he has health coaches in his practice and they bridge the gaps in between appointments. And so I think that 
in many instances, these health coaches are providing a much needed service that clinicians themselves can't provide. They either don't have the amount of time they need with a patient to be able to go through the nutritional history, talk more about lifestyle. They may be able to do a cursory discussion, but I know when I was still working in clinical cardiology, I couldn't spend an hour talking to a patient about the nutrition piece, but we know from experts like Dr. Chris Palmer and Dr. Perlmutter, both of whom have been on the podcast, we know there's this complex in a relationship between the foods that we eat, the types of neurotransmitters that our body produces, the bulk of which are produced in the stomach and in the gastrointestinal tract and not our brain. So when we start talking about medical therapy and pharmacotherapy and talking about selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, helping people understand that there is a place for medication, but in many instances, a lot of lifestyle changes can make an enormous impact on our mental health. And, and I would actually argue that should be frontline therapy. Obviously, if someone is in crisis, that is different. They may very well need not only medication, they may also need hospitalization to be, to be in a position where they're safe. And certainly many years ago, when I was a nursing student, I was a, uh, I worked on the eating disorder unit during my, my psych rotation. And you better believe those poor patients got, you know, I remember they would try to hide their food and just about anything but it was almost an edible looking food. So I thought to myself, even if they wanted to eat, there's no incentive to eat mushy vegetables and, you know, overcooked meat and probably way more carbohydrate than they probably had any interest in eating. So thank you for bringing that to our attention. And certainly um, we will make sure that we put links to the health coaching program that you are actively involved in. And I applaud you for you know, understanding how important it is to have that level of support for patients that sometimes we can't solely depend on the provider to provide all that level of support. This is where I think health coaching is so impactful. Last but not least, I'd love to kind of touch on mind-body medicine. I know some people may think they know what that is, but helping people understand that our psychological wellness impacts symptoms that we experience, whether they be positive or negative, and how a lot of what I consider to be, you know, symptoms of bigger issues where like chronic headaches, chronic diarrhea, chronic constipation, um, sometimes, you know, low level anxiety or panic attacks can be a byproduct of this mind body connection and also our lifestyle. Let's wrap things up today, because I think this is an important point that I want to make sure we make today is that, you know, working diligently on our mental health can help support our physical health quite significantly. Absolutely. Well, I have been doing mind body medicine since the seventies before we called it mind body medicine when it was just breathing, not breath work. And <laughs> I had a saying when I would give lectures back in the day, and that is what's real in the mind is real in the body. And that has the only difference uh, between back then when I was saying that and now is that we have the imaging techniques, we have the data, we have the research that is showing, just as this we talked about earlier, that science is evolving. So what does that mean? What's real in the mind is real in the body. So if you think of a, a sorting system, think about you are sorting laundry, darks and lights. There's no grays in between. It's just two buckets. And you have to make a decision. Every thought, every image is either going to be stark, light, safety, danger. If it's safety, if I am saying right now, oh, this is this has so, been so great to talk with you. Um, I'm really excited when it airs. Um, I'm really enjoying this. Uh, or even if I'm saying like, oh, we're nearing the end. That's a neutral thought. That would go in the light basket. But if I am saying, oh, I was so inarticulate. Oh, I didn't do a good job. Uh, you're not going to like what I'm saying. For example, uh, I was at a loss for words. I didn't answer that question really well. So now you are judging and you are then putting that thought into the danger category at a very low level. So it's not like I'm shaking with fear but there's some muscle contraction that's starting to take place. There's a distortion. You're shifting over into the sympathetic from the parasympathetic nervous system. There's some sense 
that there's some danger and it affects everything. And then it can escalate from there to a higher level, which would be like, oh, this is the worst I've ever done. This is awful. This is terrible. Um, and you might start getting into even a panic state like, oh, I can't breathe. I'm, I'm so stressed. Um, I'm such a screw up. Why can't I um, do these podcast interviews well? And so now you're extending it. Now you're at a higher, higher level. So how do you intervene? Well, it's integrative. It's not one size fits all. It's not one method. It's not, oh, all I'll do is breathe or I'm going to meditate for five to 10 minutes. That'll take care of it. It often starts with the thought change. Like, so what if I didn't answer that question that well? My life will still go on. Uh, and so there are many strategies that comes from cognitive behavior therapy where you're actually reformulating those thoughts. And if you blend that with, I'm going to take a breath and, oh, wait, my shoulders are up to here. I'm going to let that go. So it's a physical process of muscle relaxation and looking at, so that in an essence, in a nutshell, is the mind-body medicine. And then there are approaches like you can go to uh, get a massage, you can do yoga, you can meditate. Those are practices that are coming from mind-body medicine. But the actual theory is how our mind and body travel together. They cannot be separated. Well, thank you so much for that. I think that it is without question, it, it, the more that we understand about this interrelationship, the more we can do to support our bodies. Please let listeners know how to connect with you on social media, how to listen to your podcast, get connected to the health coaching program, et cetera. Sure. So on social media, I am uh, in Instagram at Dr. Sandy. Functional Med Coach is our Functional Medicine Coaching Academy's Instagram page and functionalmedicinecoaching.org. This is a wonderful time to consider being a health coach because you can, uh, especially if you are dissatisfied with your career, if you have a strong sense of having a mission to serve others, uh, then you know we are. This profession is growing, uh, and our podcast is Health Coach Talk, and that is where we talk all about health coaching, whether you want to work with a coach, be a coach or hire a coach, if you're a practitioner or a company wanting to improve the health of your employees. Awesome. Thank you again for coming on my friend. Thank you. This has been delightful to talk with you. Hey, if you like this video, you guys are going to love this video and I'll see you there.